my pleasure to welcome uh, Nathan Wilson. You may know his work as an author. Uh, you may not know that he is a 1999 graduate of New St. Andrews College in Idaho. And he also holds a master's degree in uh, liberal arts from St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. He has also taught at New St. Andrews in Idaho. He's the author of several books of young adult fiction, including such title as, titles as the 100 Cupboards Trilogy and Leap Pike Ridge, if I'm pronouncing that right, also including the popular Notes from the Tilt-A-Wheel, Wide-Eyed Wonder in God's Spoken World. He's also a film producer and screenwriter and is in the midst of producing a motion picture to be released later this year, a film rendition of C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. Mr. Wilson is also the managing editor for Credenda Agenda magazine, and he's published short fiction in the Chattahoochee Review and Esquire magazine. How'd you get that one? That's good. <clears throat> in 2005, he published an essay in Books and Culture entitled Father F Brown Fakes the Shroud. <clears throat> I gotta go back and find that one. The piece adapted the literary detective work of G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown to the mystery of the Shroud of Turin, and it garnered him some national coverage in multiple media sources like Discovery Channel, uh, World News Tonight, ABC, Good Morning America, and even there was a segment on Comedy Central, so that must have been a lot of fun. My favorite. I can imagine. <clears throat> He's written two novella-length satires of evangelical <laughs> apocalyptic fiction titled Right Behind and, and Supergeddon. Got to check those out. Nathan and his wife Heather have four children and live in Idaho. Welcome to Patrick Henry College. Thanks very much. So, Nate, what's the earliest memory of writing that you have? The earliest memory of writing, I think, happened somewhere in the sixth or seventh grade. And we were living in my grandparents' house because our house had burned down. Mm -hmm. One of the most dramatic moments of my childhood, getting to stand in the front yard, watching the, the roof of my home disappear in flames. How old were you then? Uh, I think fourth grade, okay, and fourth or fifth grade, and then I, I really am bad at keeping track of years. My sisters will both just like name the day, and what they were wearing, and for me, it's sort mm -hmm. of it was before this other time. It was before we lived in that other house. Okay, uh, so we moved into we we were moving around while the house was being renovated, and we ended up in my grandparents' house. And I had recently resolved to write. That's what I wanted to do, and this so that means I had to have been about the sixth grade. And I was trying to, I remember trying to describe fire. And this is this early memory. And I was sitting there trying to describe firelight. And I, re, I vividly remember thinking, dancing firelight. It's like the most cliched thing you'd come up with ever. And I thought to myself, yes. Like, I'm, <laughs> like I've got it. It's, that one's nailed. That one's in the bag. And so, uh, so I... I described this firelight as dancing. I remember the satisfaction that came from that and then the later discovery that uh, that was not any good. That's where the, the literary expression, we must kill our darlings, yes. comes from there. And so you, had, you eventually got rid of the dancing firelight. The dancing, uh, yeah. What would the, be a better way to describe now that you have? Any other way. Any other way. <laughs> all right. I mean, it's the reason, there's a reason why it's a cliche. There's a reason why all cliches are cliches because you want it to be playful, it's moving, it's, you know, it's flickering, what are you going to do? How, you can't say flickering. Uh, so what kind of metaphor are you going to draw in there? And my sixth grade self really struggled with that. Uh, now I just don't describe firelight. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, growing up with uh, parents being leaders in a church, I mean, your dad right, yeah. writing uh, some very influential books, there's... Uh, there's the blessing and the curse of being a, a preacher's, a sure. PK, an MK, a missionary's kid, yeah. a WK. Uh, advantages, disadvantages, how does that, as you think back now? You know, I, I think the, the disadvantages all turned into advantages for me. So I knew from a very early age that my father took his qualifications seriously, and I was one of those qualifications. Yeah. So I at a very young age, felt that I was in a position to ruin everything. Okay. It's like I, I could ruin all of it. And uh, I knew that, and that was true. You know, I, if I rebelled against the faith, if I chose another path, if I kicked against the, 
you know, the, the law of the Lord, you know, that I've been taught at my mother's knee, if I kicked against all that stuff, I would not just be doing something for myself. I'd be shattering, you know, my father's life work. Um, it's not that, it's not to say, oh, I thought it was all fake, but I stuck around because I didn't want to ruin his job. Uh, I was firmly convinced of it. I was never, I was never even tempted to depart from it. Um, I was raised to love it and appreciate it and try to build on it. But part of that was just, I think, the way my parents were. The house was so joyful. You know, he's, he was a pastor, but we, you know, we weren't a, a house of rules. We were a house of jokes and rock songs. And, you know, m- my dad was always on the guitar playing old Creedence Clearwater Revival stuff or Doobie Brothers. And that's not what you think of when you think of a pastor's family. So I, I really benefited from it, but I benefited immensely from the education that he worked to build, you know, the classical education model in Christian schools. And at the time, I was just going through school, punching the clock, but it was hugely beneficial. So joyfulness is important. I'm just thinking of, of sons of other well-known evangelical writers. Uh, Frankie Schaefer, sure. in relation to his dad, who seems very much in yeah. rebellion yeah. there. Um, in general, then, joyfulness, what, what are the... A joyfulness and being, being brought along on the same team at a very okay. early age. Um, and part of it is, I think I, for one weird example, I have never in my life seen my dad angry. Like, never saw him get mad, never saw him lose his temper. And I did see him, he took me into situations where he was the one Christian invited to come into this really angry room and be the, you know, be the effigy they were going to burn. You know, so I, I remember being taken along to some of these events where he'd been invited to come be the crazy Christian, you know, the one guy in the room who they could all scream at and spit right. on. And uh, standing there and watching that happen and watching his response to it. So watching him smile and laugh while writing a note to a moderator to please call the police. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm, and I'm by myself 12 years old in the crowd and he's up front. And, uh, you know, that kind of, I mean, always having been allied with him, you know, always being on his team and being brought up really, really early into that. So, and I was sitting there and he was, you know, he was asking me when we left that, what was the funniest thing that I saw? What was the funny thing? It's like, this was a situation where stuff was getting thrown, people were getting spat on, it almost got violent, you know, cops were showing up. And he was asking me, where was, what was the funniest thing? And the funniest thing actually was a guy right next to me who was screaming obscenities at him really loudly and held a sign that said no hate here while flipping him off with the other hand. <laughs> and I was 12 years old looking at this guy thinking, wait a second. <laughs> so it's, um, I mean, that, that kind of like being okay. brought into his work and seeing him uh, enjoy his call, I, I think is a big, a big, big part of it. Okay. And you felt that you could, you could ruin it. Oh yeah. In some way. I still um, could. So you see the, uh, <laughs> no, no, Bill Bennett here yesterday uh, apparently uh, was asked a couple of times uh, to be a, a vice president on a, on a ticket with, uh, he said, with Bob Dole and, and, and George W. Bush. And he said no for a number of reasons, one of which was being he was the author of the Book of Virtues. And so he was setting himself up. If sure. there was anything unvirtuous in his past, which there yeah. was, as there is in all of ours. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's kind of a, a VK, I suppose, a virtues kid <laughs> and so forth. Sure. Uh, so this is pressure, but you responded with it yeah, with it was, excitement that I can do this. Yeah, and it was helpful pressure, but also because he was not a guy who was going to lose his temper. When I okay. did mess up, it was never it was never ever. Now I will beat you. It was always um, I will come alongside. We're on the same team. Come alongside you. This is the struggle. This is the task. We're allies here. You know, let me let me help you with this. Okay. Um, and that I mean that relationship, you know is huge. You're playing both law and grace. A lot yeah. of dads, especially strong dads, you know, leaders tend to be strong guys. So strong fathers can be all law mm-hmm. for their kids and never grace. And yeah. that, that's pretty easy. So, I mean, he was a great balance of, there was nothing I could come tell him that was going to shock him or make him jump out of his chair and, yeah. and get upset. You know, it was very easy to, to talk to him and have him help me with anything. Okay, great. What was your first published piece of writing? Uh, it depends on how you define it, because okay. early on, when I, I had announced in the sixth grade to my family that I was going to write, and uh, I, found, I didn't find out, actually, until I had published with Random House, that both of my sisters thought I was joking. 
-hmm. and just thought, yeah, right, whatever, uh -huh. uh, whatever you. Uh -huh. But uh, I thought they were supportive at the, at the, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember. But my dad, however, was we had he had a church journal uh, newsletter. It was originally just a church newsletter called Credenda Agenda, which a lot of the members of the church signed up their family members for, and they signed people up for it, and it went to up to 30,000 just that way. Uh, and he said, so you want to write? So write me something. Okay. It's like, write me some fiction. It's like, you want to write fiction? Go write me a short story. And so I went and sat and slaved over this really short piece. I mean, I broke a sweat on this thing and uh, published it with that you know, 30,000 circulation okay. magazine. But it was his, you know, he was the editor. I didn't think it counts. Okay. Um, but yeah, it went out. Did he allow Dancing Firelight or? No, there was no Dancing Firelight. It was, uh, it, the whole story, it's called Sand. The whole story is about Lawrence of Arabia actually turning out to be a putz who <laughs> cannot stand sand. It's like, has a phobia of sand. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I have never had the courage to go back and read it again. <laughs> and uh, nor will I, I won't. I want to remember it happily. Uh, so that was, I was, I think, a senior in high school. Okay. And then uh, I, I just focused on short, creative work up through grad school, did some short stories through my undergrad and into graduate school, and then uh, published a lot of short creative sketches and short fiction starting then, and then attempted novels right out of grad school. And, and started sending them off to publishers? Or, or... I wrote one, and I, I had very unreasonable expectations for myself. I mean, very unreasonable expectations. I don't know how this happened, but uh, I, I was tall, young. In the eighth grade, I hit six feet. Okay. And people started asking me if I could dunk. And I, so I assumed, well, obviously, I should be able to. This is embarrassing. It's like I was an eighth grader embarrassed that I couldn't dunk in junior high. Uh, and I'd heard that writers should write every day. So I set out to write a novel and thought, I will do 3,000 words a day. That'll be great. You know, that, that's a very reasonable expectation. And so I did. Uh, it was awful. Horrible stuff. And so I wrote the first novel and got to the end of it, printed it out, read it, and dropped the whole thing in the trash can. Um, I then made a list of everything I hated about it. Dropped it in the trash can. Dropped it in the trash can. Uh, and then made a list of every single thing I hated and taped it to the wall by my computer. Uh, you know, everything I hated about the pace, about the characters, about the villain, I mean, everything. And then I started working on the next one and had this constant reminder on the wall of everything I'd messed up last time. And then I messed up entirely in the opposite direction. So I wrote the first one. It was too short and too fast, you know, 45,000 words, 40,000 words, something like that. This next one was 175,000 words. You know. So it's, uh, it went out of control the opposite. So I, then I made another list of things I hated. And, and, wait, and did, did yeah. the 175,000, did that also go into the trash can? Or? No, that one actually, there was enough salvageable material okay. that that was actually the first draft of the 100 Coverage Trilogy. Okay. So the, the second one, I threw one in the trash, made the list, and then started 100 Coverage, which, by the way, anybody could tell me at the time, if, if I told you I'm going to do a story for kids about 100 cupboards in a wall that go to 100 different places. Anybody could tell me this is not a one, a one volume thing. Right. Uh, but I tried. You tried. So that's why I went 175,000. So you were able to dunk manuscripts into, the, into a basket. Just throw them. Just, yeah. Or maybe even jump shots. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was good at dunking manuscripts. Yes. So. All right. All right. And so the first thing then that was published by a non-paternal yeah, non-paternal publishing. Uh, uh, book I wrote for Books and Culture, and I don't remember if that was before. That was before Esquire, Chattahoochee Review. So this, this Books and Culture piece in which I decided to tackle the Shroud of Turin with a creative literary process. Right. And I heard a, an apologist speak on the Shroud of Turin, and he made me mad because he picked up his Bible and he flopped it, one of those big floppy Bibles. And he said, I don't need this. I don't need this. Sets it down. You I just have, need the shroud? I have the shroud of Turin. Okay. I have a photograph of the moment of resurrection. And I remember sort of thinking, like hell you do. I mean, just, <laughs> I was just mad. Like, what are you talking about? Like, setting the Bible aside. Oh, look at me. I've got, you know, I've got this relic, this medieval relic. So I went and was looking at the gospel accounts and, Look at it in John, where it's just the, the shroud is described as multiple cloths and one for the head, and, and it's just not what we have uh, with the shroud. And I was very irritated by it because his, his talk after having flopped his Bible 
was very compelling. So his talk afterward is, this, this is amazing. This shroud is a photo negative, a photo negative, which nobody had even discovered yet, which cannot be duplicated by the human brain. You're not capable of actually negativing an image by hand. Uh, it's three-dimensionally encoded onto the cloth, and, which means exposed from more than one place. So if, it, if we did that, it'd be like 3D, a 3D camera. So you have two lenses. So this is a three-dimensional image, a photo negative. How could this be created in the 1300s? Hmm. So the, axiomatically, I looked at it and thought, I don't think this is real because I believe the Gospel of John. However, if I think it was faked in the 1300s, I need to not think that da Vinci invented a time machine and, and went back there uh, to confuse us all. Right. So, which is, you know, one theory. But, um, so I just thought per I... Perfectly <laughs> sensible yeah. theory. Yeah, it, it, it is. So. It actually is one of the, I mean, the time machine part's not, but the, <laughs> okay. the, the da Vinci found a way to do it across centuries is one okay. of the theories. But, all right. So that was, basically I looked at it and thought I should be able to do this with lo-fi technology. There should be a, if I'm a medieval forger, there should be a very simple explanation. You know, the Occam's razor thing. And uh, I sat on my hands literally sat on it because I, I had such a bunch of nervous energy going. I had my legs bouncing, sat on my hands. I started thinking about it, and I just, like, I can't do this. You know, I, I give up. I'm going to put it in a Father Brown story because I had just binged on G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown collection, and I had just literally binged on it. I had gone from left to right through the complete short stories, and they were all the same, uh -huh. and they are all surprising. There's this one detective, Father Brown, who always asks the question, that no one knows they're assuming. He questions the assumption that's unidentified. Hmm. We all make assumptions, but there are sometimes when everyone is making an assumption that they don't, they're, not, they're not aware of. So I basically just stuck it into a Father Brown story and said, okay, so let's let Father Brown do it. He's smarter. If I, if I put this in a Father Brown mystery, what question would I predict for that character if I was the author writing the story? And the question was, how do you know this image was put on the cloth at all? Because I was sitting there thinking, how do you put this image on the cloth? How do you put this image on the cloth? How do you put this image on the cloth? Like, why do I think this image was put on the cloth? And if, if you ask yourself that nonsense question, apparently nonsense question, you're left with, it wasn't, everything else was taken away. So the image wasn't imposed, everything else was removed. If you think that, it's, it's sort of easy. It's like, well, you have linen, glass, paint a face on glass and set it on linen in the sun, the image is made photo negative. The sun travels and exposes it three-dimensionally. Boom. You've got it. So I climbed out a bathroom window at New St. Andrews College with a piece of glass and some cloth and a finger-painted face of Jesus. Um, not actually Jesus, but a Christ-like, recognizable, iconic figure. Um, Something that seems it could be, let's say, in a slice of pizza where the face of Jesus would appear. Yeah, a little better than that. But, um, so I hopped out. The president of the college was looking at me. He said, what are you, what are you doing? I was like, trust me. This is... And it wasn't, very much, wasn't long after that that the bathroom windows were locked. But I got out of the, I got out of the bathroom window onto the roof of the college, set the uh, cloth down with the window over it, and 10 days later I had a photo-negative three-dimensional image of Christ on the linen without any dyes or paints or pigment. Um, and so I wrote my article and then got hundreds of thousands of hate emails. <laughs> so that was the first one that was non-paternal. And then but, but certainly a very good science fair project. Yeah, it really was. I should have gotten a blue, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, sounds like you may have learned more about the importance of presuppositions from Father Brown yeah. than from any philosophical work, Cornelius <laughs> Van Til or others. Yeah, well, Father Brown resonated because of them. Okay. Um, I read a comment by you somewhere that, uh, that you actually learned more philosophy, maybe even theology, from C.S. Lewis and Tolkien yeah. than from anything you studied in college. Yeah. So, so uh, what advice then do you have for students in college here as far as developing their own worldviews? Uh, never, ever take a philosopher seriously. So. <laughs> ever. And I, I enjoy There's it. a little bit of nervous laughter here. I, <laughs> don't do it. Um, you know, philo I, I actually really enjoyed philosophy. So I studied philosophy. I did it at the grad graduate level and undergrad level. I read all the nonsense and realized that when people name things a prolegomena to all future metaphysics, uh -huh. take the kind of person who does that and then put him in fiction <laughs> and watch Kant walk around, Kant the human, not Kant the thinker. Uh -huh. Do you like this guy? 
do you trust him? It's like, do you want to listen to him? And do you have any reason to believe that he's actually trying to make sense or that he just wants to talk into perpetuity so that there can always be dissertations about what exactly he meant? Um, the, one of the routes to immortality is philosophers attempting to be impossible to interpret. So Wittgenstein, you know, brown, blo- you know, brown book, blue book, he didn't even write it. He just, you know, he blathered to his students and uh-huh. they got to copy it down. So we've got this third hand thing of him. Why, why do I care? Heidegger was a Nazi. Uh, so why am I going to listen to anything he has to say after that? If he thought gassing the Jews was okay, does he have any ethos with me? Um, so I've read him, but I don't give him much time. So I have enjoyed this. Descartes had some great things. Pascal has some great things. There's a lot of guys. The best guys are always the guys who aren't actually philosophers. Nietzsche is a joy to read. And he's a joy to read because he says exactly what he means. And he says it with strength and force. And there's no question. What does Nietzsche think? Hmm. It's like, well, what did Heidegger really mean? What did Wittgenstein really mean? What did Kant really mean? What did Spinoza really mean? It's like there's always wrangle room. Nietzsche, we're all pretty clear. We know know what Nietzsche meant. Uh, And he wrote really well. So you can engage with him and argue with him and defeat him. But there's no question of clarity. So philosophers... You know, philosophers basically are all spinning a tale of reality. They're all trying to tell you a fantasy novel, but they're giving you the rules for the universe. So they come to you and they say, here is my fantasy, and here are the rules by which my Middle Earth will be governed. Mm -hmm. In my world, the greatest good for the greatest number will be morally good. Mm -hmm. And you think, okay. So uh, in that, I got in trouble in one uh, college classroom for saying, so the ethics of gang rape then is what we're looking at. So as long as there's a minority victim and a majority happy, we're okay. It's like, that's, that's good. And the, I, I was immediately, I think, sent outside that classroom. Uh, but, that's an embarrassment to your dad. Yeah, actually, no. I think he, he gave me a little gold sticker. When I got right, right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, philosophers, I, I have gotten a great deal of pleasure from the philosophers, but primarily uh, because I enjoy arguing angrily with people. So I suspect you are planting the seeds for some very subversive term papers here. (laughs) Read it uh, and enjoy shredding it. um, That's why, is is that one reason why you started to go to be writing fiction rather than trying to write theological tomes? You know, I I always wanted to write fiction. Fiction was always a priority. Part of that was because of Lewis's description of the way people engage with stories. Uh And this is why Christians have sometimes been suspicious of stories because they really can't influence you. Uh, if you read, I don't know, if you read the Twilight novels once a month for a year, I think you'd be a different human afterward, um, and not a sparkly one. <laughs> so it's, it's like stories do actually, stories are like catechisms, but they're catechisms for your impulses. They're catechisms with flesh on. What do you do? What is nobility? What is sacrifice? You know, what... In the, in the Hunger Games, for example, a really, really well-told story. Very well-told. She's very, very excellent with her craft. And at the same time, is it okay to just kill or be killed? Mm-hmm. Can you just be thrown in a gladiator game with a bunch of other innocent victims and think it's okay to gut them when they're also victims because you might get gutted yourself if you don't? Mm-hmm. It's like, is that, is that, is that the, that's an ethical excuse of Darwinism, not Christianity. That's not how the Christian martyrs functioned. Uh, Christians are never afraid of death. Survival is never the ultimate good. Uh, sacrifice frequently is. And, and so you see these sleight of hands and where priorities are placed. And it's easy to, be, uh, to have worldviews really grown, seated in you, because you're reading things without thinking. You, you process films, you process novels without really thinking through them. And I actually enjoy that book, Hunger Games. But, so, um, you know, so fiction is, is a way I, li- I do like apologetics and philosophical engagement. Fiction is a way, I think, to put flesh on it and make it more wholesome and more effective. So, so how much has Darwinism affected, perhaps infected, 20th century fiction? Uh, immensely. You know, it's like immensely. Any, any time you actually, uh, I have no problem with trying to survive. But the great books, the books that really resonate with people in a lasting way are the books when you have a character who chooses that survival is not is not actually the priority number one. So that's actually a Harry Potter example. So Harry Potter, whether you like it or don't like it or all the flaws you might see in the whole series, or if you're a super fan, 
at the end, you have a guy who chooses to lay down his life to stand in the right place and fight the right fight. It's like, which is the correct way to go. Uh, and that's a kick against, uh, you know, that, that kind of um, ethical sensibility. But I do, I also think that we've ricocheted into sentimentalism hmm. more. I think we chased Darwinism early at the beginning of the 20th century. We had this really bad reductio ad absurdum with Germany and the Holocaust and the eugenics movement. And then now we're kind of all awkwardly pretending like our premises didn't lead us there. Hmm. You know, we've backtracked it. We still, hold, we still embrace the same premises that would take us to that conclusion again, but we're pretending like now they'll take us someplace different. Hmm. Now we'll, we'll go in a different way and we're very sappy uh, you know, and saccharine about it. So I think it's, we kick against it right now, but it can't last. Interesting. Do you, do you like the Harry Potter books? I do. I enjoy them. I, I have plenty of criticisms to throw out, but at the same time, I can't throw out any without having it be some kind of sour grapes. Um, I'm, I'm really appreciative and grateful for her, for what she's done for that marketplace. You know, she blew the doors off young adult fantasy, and adults read my, more, tens of thousands of adults read my stuff that, who never would have never. because of what she's done. So I'm grateful to her. Overall, I think they're a valuable story, and I'd have quibbles throughout the series, but nothing terribly interesting to say. Okay, who, who are your favorite current novelists? You know, I, I enjoy Megan Whalen Turner. She writes in, in my market, uh, The Thief, The Queen of Atolia, those books. I really admire Tom Wolfe. Mm -hmm. I, I admire him a great deal. The conceptually, stylistically? Or? Stylistically and conceptual, okay. conceptually. Yeah. And uh, his, his perception, his insight into humans and what makes humans do what they do. And, and as individuals and as collective units. So these are not re necessarily, necessarily recommendable books. Like, oh, go be entertained by this. Uh, but they are very, very insightful into the behavior of humanity. So currently the whole Penn State thing uh, is a Tom Wolfe novel. Mm -hmm. And that is, how do you get from a guy being a scuzzbuck at 1998 to riots at Penn State in 2011? How do you fire a coaching legend for something he didn't actually do or know about fully? It's like the way we turn on people and scapegoat people, uh, the way it all grows, you know, little choices that you make when you don't know they matter. So Paterno takes a phone call, hears about what happening in, two, you know, in 2002. What exactly does he hear? Well, I can tell you the story. This is fiction. But if, you, if you're Tom Wolfe and you're writing it, you're the coach who sees something inappropriate happening in the shower, and you pull a coward. You leave the scene. Then you go tell the boss. But now you have yourself to protect. It's like now that you tell the boss, it's like, wait, I actually saw a boy getting molested, and I left. It's like I'm a grown man. I walked in on this, and I left him there. And now I'm going to tell on that, but I am now culpable. So when he tells Paterno, Paterno says the guy told him that he saw another coach kind of horsing around inappropriately. Hmm. You know, that's because, of course, he would downplay it. He'd make a choice to downplay it. Otherwise, he's immediately culpable for not having jumped in himself. Paterno then kicks it up, but Paterno is not worried about it. And then years later, it comes out that this was really, really bad, actually, what happened. And everything's blowing up, and media vans are being flipped over, and rocks are being thrown, and stuff's lit on fire. And... And this is how people, little choices, like little decisions, left or right, good or evil, that don't really seem to matter, little lies, uh, can turn into massive, massive problems. That's interesting. So you're suggesting that every report would minimize the enormity of sure. this? Sure. Especially so, so early on. Because if you think human motivation, how does the human animal behave? A guy who walked by that and did nothing. Mm -hmm. When he relays that information, where's his... You know, where is he personally invested? What, what's his goal in, in that? Well, I've got to actually pass it up to cover my tail. But I also actually have to not really heighten it to cover my tail. Uh, and, you, and then the whole thing just snowballs and grows. So I Am Charlotte Simmons, The Bonfire of the Vanities, Man in Full. These are all novels that, where he tells these stories of little decisions, mm -hmm. little choices that make you who you are as a character, and then in the end, damn or redeem you. It's like, but it's these little things. And C.S. Lewis does the same stuff. The Great Divorce, which I love, is all about people hung up on little tiny things, like heaven or hell. 
is all about these little things that they won't let go of. You know, little tiny pieces of pride they can't sacrifice, lust, you know, that, that kind of thing. Now, would you want to write, you said this would be a good, a good subject for Tom, a Tom Wolfe novel. Would you want to write a novel? Like that? Yeah, I, I would, but I, I would be more like Chesterton on that one, where I would, I would be more interested in having the idea for the novel. Mm -hmm. uh, those kind of novels are not entertaining, and I don't really want to live in that world for 700 pages. So the amount of time it would take me to research and write 700 pages of Romans 1, Romans 1, Romans 1. Um, everybody has sinned, dark, dark, dark. La, 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 damnation. It's like... <laughs> 700 pages of that, I'd, I'd be pretty road-weary. So I'd be attracted to it, but uh, at the same time, uh, I don't think I would drift there to tell a story myself, just because it, it would absorb me for longer than I'd want to dedicate okay. myself. Now, in, in Tilt-A-Whirl, uh, the book, the video, I mean, you have some dark subjects, including sure. uh, you're, wa you're walking through the graveyard yeah. and so forth. So you're willing to deal with that. But you, you oh, yeah. No, I think that darkness, I, yeah, I think, I don't, I don't want to misquote him. I think it was Chesterton who said that a book without evil is an evil book. And okay. if I misquoted somebody, oh well. It was Gilbert Keith Chesterton who said it, and I stand by it. Um, I, I think that's a deep truth. And I, I answer a lot of questions from parents of every stripe who say, uh, currently about my, my new book, The Dragon's Tooth, just yesterday on the radio, I was like, so this book is violent. There are guns. What do you have to say to parents? Like, well, guns exist. <laughs> People use them for good and for evil. And would you be more comfortable with a wand and a death curse? You know, sort mm -hmm. of like that's, but because they don't believe that you can really wand someone to death, uh, they're more comfortable with their kids thinking about it than actually having to learn to face a real evil, which actually exists. Uh, and so I try to, in my, in my stories, and anything I write, I want to engage with darkness. I want to engage with it. I want to engage with it in exactly the same way God engage, engages with it in his story. Mm -hmm. So how does God use darkness in his narratives? How, what role does it play in his plots? Mm -hmm. The story of the cross, the story of Moses and Pharaoh, the story of Samson. It's like I look at those stories and I want to imitate them. And I want to Im imitate them in every way, but one of the most important ways is in ratio and use of good and evil. Hmm. So when is the character flawed? You know, where does darkness come from? How powerful is darkness? I don't like the Joker in Batman because he's an omnipotent Satan. Hmm. It's like he's just psycho and everywhere at once. I also don't like Batman in Batman because um, he's just a billionaire in a bat suit with no superpowers. <laughs> Sneaking into people's bedrooms. So, I, I, but it's... So it's, how do I want to use darkness? I want to use it the way God uses it. And he uses it uh, pretty liberally in a lot of his stories. Yeah. But ultimately, the light comes and the light triumphs. Do, do evangelicals tend to be squeamish, too squeamish in reading? I've, I, and actually, in, the, in the, the book, Notes from the Tilt World, and in the DVD, I talk about sort of the, the knee-jerk reaction of evangelicals. We tend, as a people, as a Christian people, to react into baskets of kittens on posters with Bible verses, or I'm an edgy hipster and Tarantino is the best storyteller of our time. You know, and, that's, and those are our choose your path. Kittens or Kill Bill? Like, which, which is it? And uh, the, the key is to, to look at the character of God. So God, tell, you know, God made kittens, yes, he did. Are they cute? Yes, they are, they are. Are they cute in baskets? Well, there, there's some questions, but <laughs> I'll concede it. Sure, they're even cute in baskets. Are they also killing machines? Yes, they're killing machines. And people who like the kittens in baskets want to forget that part. It's like they want, they want to just sort of like, well, ignore it. If they were big enough, they would kill you. That's it. Your own house cat would just take you down. But it's, uh, but God made them. And then you look at tornadoes. Did God make them? Yes. Does God tell stories of heroin addicts and alleys in Seattle? Yes, he does. Uh, and so you have the, the edgy hipster type say, well, then that'll be the only story I tell. I will spend all my time in the, in the alleys of Seattle, and I will not acknowledge the presence at all of anything cute. Sunsets, kind of tacky. I will always have the sun setting over an industrial wasteland. 
I will never have that pink, fluffy cumulus effect because that's just weak. You know, it's like that's, so we, we just veer. And the goal should be to, to be as much like God, the storyteller, as we can be, which means, can you use pink? It's like, well, have you ever seen anybody use more pink than God? Yes, the sky is pink, and yet it's pink because all of Montana burned in a forest fire. It's like, you're like, man, this is an amazing sunset. I'm inspired. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of smoke jumpers and helicopters and you know, acres are burning. It's like you have, you have both. It's like you always have both. He's, he is a complete picture. And I think evangelicals really do veer. Either for secular respect, they veer into one treatment of darkness. They don't bring hope. They don't bring light. Or because they don't like that discomfort, they veer off into cutesiness. I suspect there are lots of questions from folks here. We'll turn to those in a moment. Let me just ask one more for now. In Tilt a Whirl, you deal with the problem of evil yeah. essentially by saying that God is a writer. Yeah. God is producing a narrative. Maybe you can go into that a little bit and then think of your questions and be ready to ask them in a couple of minutes. Go ahead. Uh, here's, here's the simple answer that the Apostle Paul gives is, who are you, O oh man? It's like once the questions of how dare God, how, how dare God, how, how dare God, and so on, um, you get to a certain point and Paul says, who are you, pot, to ask the potter uh, why he made you? Uh, but the, the question is, what is, what is the goal for reality? Like, what is the actual goal for this place? And if you, if you break it all down and you actually, you do need to, you acknowledge ex nihilo creation, which is not just a, like you tick a box and say it's ex nihilo. You know, this right here is made of textiles, which are, you know, cells first, fibers, carbons. You get all the way down to the elemental level, and you've got atoms. You've got a little nucleus and an electron whistling around it, allegedly. Uh, I've never seen one. So electron whistling around it and approaching the speed of light. It's mostly emptiness. But these electrons cling together to form things and are all moving wicked fast all the time. And we sit on them. But it's, it's there. It's, it's buzzing around it. And what's that made of? And it's, well, what's, what are electrons made of? Seriously? Do we have to answer that question? Nobody does. Leptons. What's that? Something we named a lepton. That's what it is. Up quarks and down quarks, elementary particles. What are those made of? Nobody will tell you because they would all be making it up. And you, you, we've all laughed at those ancient civilizations that have said things like the world is on the back of a turtle, on the back of a turtle, on the back of a turtle. We do the exact same thing. What's it made of? What's it made of? What's it made of? We keep going down, 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 and eventually you hit the wall. You hit a place where this thing, whatever it is that we can't see, this thing was made from nothing. The answer is nothing. From nothing. Ex nihilo, that's what it means. And it's ex nihilo right now. So not way back when, right now. It's currently spoken. It's like this world was created with speech, it is spoken art. So reality is verbal art, verbal storytelling. Uh, if God stopped saying chair, you would hit the floor. It's like he is saying chair, and his words become flesh. It's like everything here is all micro-incarnation, and then there was the great incarnation. But micro-incarnation, he says chair, it's here. What's it made of? Nothing, ultimately. It's speech. It's like, and if you start to look at reality that way, it's like this is a poem, this is a play, this is a novel, this is visual art. Why would there be darkness? Why would that bullet right before it hits somebody's skull, still be spoken. It's not, it's not just a question of why would God allow there to be evil. It's a question of why, you know, why doesn't he stop his mouth constantly and prevent us from all these things? You know, he wouldn't have to interfere. He would just have to cease. Like if he would cease talking, uh, then this would go away. Um, but this world, I think, is, is spoken art. I think it's narrative. And then the question is, could you, if you were Frodo the Hobbit, raise the problem of evil to Tolkien. Here's what I have to say, Frodo says, and this is the traditional postulation. Either God is not all good. Either the author of the story, Frodo says, is not really good at his job. Or he is not, uh, he's either dark, basically, so either not all good or not all holy. Um, and by good, I mean their craft. So like he's either not all competent um, Tolkien is either bad at writing or evil. Or option three, he doesn't exist. 
Does that, does that argument, does the syllogism hold water? Could Frodo look at his reality and say, of the author, there, there either isn't one, or he sucks, or he's really evil. And that's what, that's what the philosophers give us. Those are your choices. And we look at Frodo and we can say, you idiot. It's like, this is, it's a good story. The evil is here to be beaten. It's here to be overcome. It's here to show the glory of the light. It's here to be broken. Break it. It's like, go throw the ring in the volcano. Don't sit there and look at it and say, there is no Tolkien. <laughs> because if there was, how could such an evil exist? He's either really bad at his job. This works for Hamlet. Hamlet could deny the existence of Shakespeare and say, or if he does exist, he's a bad writer. He's either a bad writer, bad at controlling his narrative, or he's an evil writer, or he's not. And we do the exact same thing. But suddenly, when we are Frodo the Hobbit, or we are Hamlet, it appears to hold water for us. And we would never say to Hamlet, oh, that's a valid syllogism, stick with it, buddy. We'd never say it to Frodo, but we say it to ourselves. We say, well, the problem of evil is really difficult. It's like, it's not, actually. It's not logically difficult at all. Logically difficult. It's emotionally difficult. It is emotionally difficult to be Hamlet. It is emotionally difficult to be Frodo. It's emotionally difficult to be a human being in this story when anything goes wrong. It's like, and that's true. So you can talk to somebody who's radically angry like Nietzsche because they, had a, they were born with a birth defect. You can talk to somebody who's radically angry because of something, some tragedy that happened. Uh, you can talk to them, and, and it is an emotional problem. But one of, the, one of the dead giveaways for the fact that it is an emotional problem, not a rational problem, is the fact that they're mad. This atheist is mad at God who does not exist. Uh, my father has often told atheists, Christopher Hitchens and other guys who are friends of his, that there are two basic tenets of atheism. One, there is no God. Two, I hate him. <laughs> and that's it. And this is the most spiteful thing I can think of to do to him and say, well, you're not even there. La, 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 la. <laughs> uh, and that's really the route. So the problem of evil for me is I've murdered people. If God is culpable, I am culpable. It's like I have killed people in my fiction. I have allowed darkness in my fiction. And I hope that I use that black paint on the canvas the same way he does to bring greater glory to the son, to the spirit, to the father, and so on. You know, the, the chief purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The purpose of his creation, the ultimate good that could come from reality is to glorify God. There's not a higher good. So this is a narrative which will reveal his attributes best and will serve that best. Emotionally, the pill can always be tough to swallow. You can go to the Apostle Paul and say, listen, pottery, who are you to complain whether you're the, the dinner china or the toilet bowl? It's like, you know, ultimately it was the potter's decision and uh, he, he chose what he needed. Questions? If that doesn't lead to questions, nothing will. Yes, Sarah, over here. Yes, do you have any sort of underlying philosophy or set of principles that you state to yourself that to reach for as you are seeking to improve your stories? You know, honestly, it's about efficacy of reaching human beings as opposed to like the philosophical construction of the narrative. So what will be best for kids now? So what do these kids need? And when I write fiction, I feel like I'm cooking for a crowd of strangers. It's like I'm cooking something, which I hope is wholesome and feeds their imagination and feeds their souls and gives them a taste of something good. Uh, so I'm all, you're always going to experiment and do something different than you did last time because it's still there. It still exists, and you want to push and grow. Uh, probably the one big overarching thing I do constantly is I, I really try to reach... <coughs> Uh, what I would just call father hunger. You know, our culture is so father absent. You know, just absent dads, unengaged dads, just dads who aren't even there, dads who took off, uh, that there's this deep hunger. And that hunger feeds in naturally into atheism. So there is no father. Like, well, all you know of a father is absence. So when you, you then project that absence uh, and, and work from there, you are all on your own, you're alone, you're lost. And so on. So trying to write to that, trying to f feed that uh, is, a big, is a big thing for me. But I do that with different stories. So that would be probably the one thing that's kind of hanging there always. Everything else is what do I want to tr try to do with this story in particular? Which types of male readers do I really want affected by this? Uh, it's, it's more about narrative impact 
and narrative joy. I'm, I'm also, these are not philosophical treatises. I want them to taste good. I want them to be fun. I want them to be exciting. Um, and especially right now with the current series, which is called Ashtown Burials, nice and dark, speaking of darkness. Uh, the first book is The Dragon's Tooth. The whole driving force behind it is to try to get kids to realize that they live in a fantasy world, that you, you finish a novel and you don't think, now back to my unmagical, boring existence. It's, this place is crazy. All the grass outside is made out of thin air by sunlight. It's like heat from a ball of fire in the sky turns into you know, carbon dioxide. Go breathe on some grass and the carbon from the carbon dioxide, that plant will grab onto it, that thin air grab some heat from the sun and rip the carbon out and make itself a leaf. It doesn't, it's not made out of the dirt. It's like it's made out of thin air. We're on a ball of rock flying at Mach 86 around a ball of fire in the sky. Right now. Just, yay, just around and around. Um, this is where we live. If I describe, I tell school kids, if I describe to Frodo how I got here in a steel tube the size of school buses, and then we had this Vapor, our alchemists made that evaporates very quickly, and if you light a match when it evaporates, whoa, it goes. So we all sit in this steel tube. Somebody stands up front and says, buckle up. We strap in, and then we light that stuff. And we go whipping through the sky, you know, six miles up or wherever it is. We hurdle along, hop a continent, and I get off, and I tell Frodo that. And I say, man, I wish I lived in a fantasy world that was magical like yours. <laughs> And Frodo could say, well, you know, I had to hang on to an eagle. <laughs> you know, it's like that's... So I, I really do, with this series in particular, I want to communicate to kids that this place is magical. Uh, and I, I want to tell fantasy because I think it's realism. You know, Moses had a wizard duel in Pharaoh's court. And it's like, it actually happened. It went down. It was real. What else do you call it when old guys, especially one of them kind of crazy looking, walks out of the desert walks out of the desert after years and years and years away with a staff, which he then turns into a snake, which he uses to turn a river into blood, calls down the angel of death, later splits a sea with this thing. It's like, is this, is this our world or not? Uh, and it is. And so I, I constantly want to infuse that, that sense, not of we're all playing make-believe, but that I am actually trying to serve the fantasy of reality by, by serving up fantasy for kids, sort of awaken wonder and, and excitement there. Based on what you've said in the course of this interview, you seem to have a high regard for poetic justice, the triumph of good and the downfall of evil. Yeah. My question then would be, should Christians write tragedies, and would you? Uh, it really depends on what you mean, because if Flannery O'Connor is included in tragedy, then absolutely yes. All right, what would be your definition of a tragedy then? A fundamental and complete hopelessness at the end. Com you know, complete hopelessness. And in O'Connor's stuff, I don't think there is. There's hopelessness for certain behaviors, uh, but she even brings grace and darkness. So if you've ever talked to somebody who's had a really a deep tragedy in their lives and they say, it was the best thing that ever happened to us, sometimes you know, like, okay, they're saying that because they think they're supposed to. And sometimes they really mean it. It's like, it, they really do. I mean, it's not a tragedy. There's an uptick after. Um, the fact that this world is not it you know, I, I've, one of the things I think we all forget very quickly is that human mortality rates are 100%. 100%. All of us die. And when we go off the stage, we don't just turn into mulch, like an atheist would say. We go off the stage, we still exist. It's like we think that death is the end, so it's tragic. It's like, but it's, it's not. It's, it, can be, it is an enemy to be overcome. It's an enemy that's been beaten and so I don't, want to, I don't ever want to act like it's an enemy that's not been beaten. So what, however I end a story, whether it's in death or darkness or, or a place of sadness, which I think we can do, I never want to say that enemy you know, stands unbeaten. Because it, it really, it doesn't. I think we could tell the story of Samson. I think it'd be glorious and it would be tragic. There'd be a bittersweet tragedy at the end. Uh, but I think it'd be a, be it'd be a beautiful story. And... Uh, so yes and no, basically. Do it right. Uh, Flannery O'Connor, I don't care for her novels as much. Short fiction is brilliant. And I think that all of her short fiction sort of is like telling the story of the Apostle Paul. Here's this self-righteous, super smart, clean-cut, rich kid who dabbles in murder through prosecution. 
Like, this is this guy. He, he's the one holding the coats, not even throwing the rocks, holding the coats when Stephen is murdered. And then he gets knocked off his donkey and blinded. For Flannery O'Connor, period, end of story. You know, but there's always this promise of there was more. You know, so this guy's gored by a bull. This guy's run over by a combine. This granny gets shot by the outlaw. But it was the best thing that ever happened to her, was getting shot by that outlaw. Uh, and so it's a unique thing. I've told people it's like drinking straight whiskey. You know, useful certain times, but not at breakfast. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, Lewis's Great Divorce would be a hard <laughs> book to make into a movie. I'm curious how you pulled off writing a screenplay for that. Let's book. all just assume that I've pulled it off. Uh, <laughs> just leave it there. Um, I actually, a, a friend of mine uh, told me that, you know, he, he was up visiting us from the crazy town, uh, La La Land uh, in L.A., and told me that they had successfully landed the rights to The Great Divorce. And I immediately just said, no, no, don't, don't do it. Um, it can't be done. Don't do it. Please, please, please stop it. And uh, then that night I was just sort of awake in bed thinking about it, you know, just playing all the scenes in my head and how you might be able to do it and thinking about the absent protagonist. There is not a protagonist at all. There's a first person singular. You know, what do you know about him? You know, A, all of this happened here, and, and this is kind of the interesting thing. You assume that, it, those of you who've read it would assume it's a dream. The thing's a dream, the story's a dream, and that's kind of a cop-out of a device at this point. 1950s, not so much. Now, he wakes up, it was all a dream. Eh, like, you know, that's, that's tough to tell. Uh, actually, it's not. It's like, if you're reading it, it's a near-death experience. It happens in an air raid in World War II in London, um, and he wakes up with the air sirens going, Planes have been bombing London, and he's been thrown from his bed. Um, so yeah, he wakes up, but it's, there's, something, there's something more there. Uh, also, you know the guy's a teacher, and you know that Lewis gave him this infusion of his own experience where he read George MacDonald at the age of 16. That's all you know about this guy. And he has no through arc of himself, you know, no through narrative. Lewis wrote it in episodes. It's an episodic piece. He wrote it over time in Serial for a magazine. And at times he just lets go of things. He starts a conflict and just drops it and moves on because he's inter interested in something else. So the question for me was, really, can I create a protagonist who has a through story through this and make it a through story that is shifted and impacted by each of these things which Lewis wrote? Because Lewis is himself shifted and impacted by each of these things. Can I build a character for whom each of these things is an impactful scene, a turning point, and so on. So that's what I've been working on. You know, but my, my goal has been absolutely to maintain and, and keep as much of what Lewis has done as possible. It's never been to remove. It's always been, what can I steal from some of his other things and infuse here to carry a story through that would be the kind of thing that he would do? He, especially, he wrote about uh, screen adaptations. You know, he says he, he fully understood that Literary stories translated to a three-act structure would have to change, and he understood that, and he was all for it. He had no problems with it. But what he said he hated was when they changed the flavor, the type of danger. So if you say, well, King Solomon's Mines was his one example. If you're trapped in a, in a tomb, it's like you're trapped in a tomb and you'll be locked in here forever, is that scarier than you know, maybe running away from a volcano? His objection was, it's just a different taste. It's a different flavor. Running from a volcano is a different flavor than being trapped alive in a tomb. And that's, that was his objection. When you go into the three-act structure, can you maintain the taste and savor and flavor of all these scenes and, uh, and their narrative impact? So that's, those have been my, that's been my guidelines for what I'm trying to do, trying to preserve as much of it as possible, and more importantly than that, all the same flavor and type. Is you mentioned at the beginning of your writing that you thought a writer had to write every day. Um, and is that still true or like what? 3,000 other... words every day. <laughs> 3,000 words or just <laughs> is it writing a little bit or is it just finding the, your process and holding yourself to it? Because I know it's easy as a writer to have like these great ideas. Yeah. But how to get them out? Sure. Uh, I would say the, the latter is the easiest answer. You know, find your process and stick to it. Writing every day is very, very helpful. But set the bar to a place where you 
have no excuse. It doesn't matter how tired you are, how late it is, you will do it. So even if you say, I will write 100 words a day, that is really short. Now you could do that just by tweeting a few times. You know, so don't do it that way. But you could do it. You set the bar there, and then you can actually get over that bar. And just the repetition of I'm writing, I'm sitting down, I have writer's block, so, so what? Write something bad. I mean, just throw it in the trash can when you're done. You're always improving. So it's, that kind of writing is like doing a bunch of push-ups. It's like every individual push-up is not the important thing. So, you, you know, on Tuesday, you're thinking, like, is it really that important that I do it today? No, but the collective impact is. You know, so you, if you do write every day, uh, you will improve. Now, if you don't have time, so you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write on Wednesdays because I don't have classes on the, you know, that day or something. You still realize that writing is, is and it, it's intense when you're really doing it. It's exhausting. So if you try to clear yourself eight hours to do it, you're going to collapse. You know, until you've really actually built up endurance for that kind of thing, it's going to be exhausting. So I would advise small Flintstone vitamin size things early on. Do it every day. Get yourself in a routine. But if you write Monday, Monday Wednesday, Friday, I mean, and you always do it, and you do a couple hundred words every time, that's terrific. I mean, that's the principle of the thing. Earlier, it sounded like you and your father actually have a really amazing relationship, which is encouraging. But do you see yourself as furthering uh, what your dad has already put in place with his ministries? Or what, or, or what you're trying to do, is it more removing yourself from that and kind of establishing your own ministry, possibly further screenplays um, sure. or more novels? Uh, I consider myself to be extremely spoiled because if my father hadn't done the work he'd done, I'd be busy trying to start a school. You know, so I have, there's an excellent school that I got to go through. I got to graduate from this school, and I'm now involved in it myself. But I'm in, involved in maintaining and trying to serve the school and putting my own kids through the school rather than thinking, like, jeepers, what am I going to do? You know, researching classical education, writing a book with Dr. Alasky way back when, which is what my father did on, on classical ed. It's like that, all that work has been done. So I get, to, I get to build on it, but think of it more like a road rather than you know, a little city wall where I, am I working inside it or outside it? You know, it's like he's, he plowed a, a real hefty path through some rough terrain, and now I don't have to. So I am really appreciative of his work, blessed by his work. I don't intend to try to repeat his work. So I'm, doing my, I'm pursuing my own goals, my own ends, but it's all, it is all connected. You know, in a linear way, I'm, I'm extending his own labor. Can you tell it? Can you, can you tell us about your wife and what impact she's had on your writing? Oh, my wife is terrific. Um, and she's had no impact whatsoever. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, my, my wife was a professional surfer when I met her. And uh, the a woman's longboard and shortboard champion of Argentina, even though she wasn't Argentinian. Um, she went down there to cover the contests, the national contests for surf magazine and just entered for what the heck and won both of them. Um, <laughs> she is really intelligent, hilarious, more inclined to read the Russians than I am. Uh, early on in our relationship, uh, I was making her read P.G. Woodhouse and she was saying, you really have to finish some Ayn Rand. Uh, and I do intentionally say Ayn Rand, not Ayn Rand. I'm not going to do it. Um, so we, we'd have, we had this great kind of tussle of a relationship. As far as, um, and she's, she's terrifically intelligent, sharp, and driven, heavily driven. And the thing she hates more than anything else in life is people who talk and don't do. So I'm sure there are people in this room, I don't sneer at you, but my wife would, who talk a lot about writing and don't write. It's like that's, that just really gets to her. Anybody who says anything that they want to achieve, and they sit back hoping that somebody else achieves it for them and then hands it off. Uh, so what happened one night was I had a buddy over and we were wrangling and talking and having a lot of fun and she was there and somebody said 100 little cupboards. And I hit the pause button on the conversation and said, that sounds like a fun title for a kid's book. 100 little cupboards. And she just laughed at me and said, that sounds like a stupid book. <laughs> and I said, no, it'll be great. And she said, no, seriously, stupid. 100 places to put your plates? Like, what are, you, what are we going to do here? 
So I immediately started arguing with her, pitching her the story. I was like, no, 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 these cupboards are mismatched. They're tiny. None of them match. They're all behind plaster in an attic wall, this old farmhouse in Kansas, and this kid is staying there. And I'm, you know, I start telling her the story. Uh, you know, one of them starts banging, some plaster falls off. The kid starts chipping all, the, all this stuff off. And she's finally like, okay, 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 fine. Fine, it'll be a good story. I think we're done, right? We're done now. Great. I won the argument. And uh, the next morning, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there groggy, eating a bowl of cereal, and she said, so when are you starting? I said, well, you know, what are you talking about? She's like, well, I like the story. You sold me on the story. I need to know how it ends. <laughs> so, you know, because she's that, just, she, I can throw a book across the room before reading the final chapter. I can read 700 words, get to the last 20 pages, and drop kick it. Um, as soon as it starts insulting me, um, or just insulting its characters, abusing the privilege of writing, whatever. I'll have all sorts of reasons to chuck it. She can't. She finish it. She has to finish. And so in this case, she was like, I want to know this story. Do this one. You need to do this. So I started writing that day. Uh, because, and it never would have happened. It wouldn't have happened, A, if she hadn't challenged me and said, that's dumb. Um, <laughs> and she initially was right. I had to work for it. You know, it's like, as I started shaping the story, I had to really work to win that argument. And then once I had, I actually found out that I'd lost. And she'd convinced me to write a novel. So yeah, no, she plays into it immensely. She's also my first reader, my first critic, my first editor. Nate has just begun here. <laughs> uh, Have I? So lots of stuff to read. I, I recommend the, uh, the Tilt a Whirl DVD. That's we're showing over there a little bit, and you could uh, read that. And right now, please join me in thanking Nate Wilson for coming today. Thank you.